They often say people look like ants when seen from a great height. I lean forward a little in my seat and look out of the window. Our flight to Peru has yet to reach cruising altitude. Below us I can just about make out roads, houses and fields, cows in a pasture, here and there a village and a city in the far distance. It's not a bad comparison, I think. Everything I can see from up here is something I have encountered in my research on ants. Fixed roads, spectacular buildings, agriculture, livestock farming. I let myself sink back into my seat. The parallels don't stop there if you think about it. Ants live in cities, just like people. In times of peace, they go about their work, sharing the labor fairly. Each has a job, from the wet nurses in the nursery to the architects, construction workers, and housekeepers in the nest, to the hunters and gatherers, who ensure that everyone is fed. But peace does not last forever, even among ants. Neighbors fight over the borders to their territory and wage bitter wars on one another. Infants' abilities to track patterns were demonstrated in a series of landmark studies that first appeared in 1996. The studies focused on how infants identified artificial spoken words embedded in much larger strings of spoken syllables. When infants hear a string of syllables, such as potato repeatedly occurring, do they start to see that string as somehow special and cohering as a unit, namely potato? They do so easily. In fact, infants under six months can learn new artificial words in under two minutes. They are artificial to make sure infants don't already have experience with them as words. In the studies, infants listen to much longer strings of syllables in which certain artificial words such as bidaku repeatedly occur amid other non-repeating random strings of syllables. No other cues to repeating three-syllable words are present such as intonation, special stress, or pauses. Based solely on repeated co-occurrences, infants reliably came to expect such sequences to occur again in the future in comparison to other completely novel three-syllable sequences for which they showed no such expectations. Working with the Department of Commerce, NASA satellites have provided orbital observations that have enabled the understanding of climate change. Satellites track weather patterns and measure the effectiveness of farming methods and innovations in agriculture, which have helped to feed millions more than we could have dreamed possible before the space age. The collection and distribution of fresh water, rapidly becoming one of the century's most valuable resources, is monitored globally. Aquaculture data, tracking stocks of fish, and modeling how to best utilize and maintain a healthy supply of this important food source, is generated from space-based observations. The identification of mineral resources is increasingly performed via satellite imagery. Satellites are also a part of the global traffic control system for aircraft. Even ground transport, trucks, trains and the like, is monitored from orbit. In short, much of what drives modern civilization is affected, and in most cases improved, by the use of data obtained from satellites. Wondering goes beyond merely being curious. Building on prior knowledge and some sense of major causal and spatial patterns, we entertain rough sketches of possibilities or interpretations and strive to learn which is more accurate and how it is filled out. To marvel at something is also linked to wondering. While marvels and wonders often refer to awe-evoking things, when children engage in wonder, they do much more than simply sit in a state of passive reverential awe. Their awe is better described by the naturalist Rachel Carson, a joyous marveling at how an insight has revealed an enormous new expanse of possible patterns to explore. It is not the dumbstruck, potentially fear-laden sense of awe experienced by adults. Almost a century ago in an isolated region of Papua New Guinea, the anthropologist Margaret Mead observed that when children were asked to explain why a canoe tied to a tree drifted away overnight, they offered explanations of how the rocking boat gradually loosened up the knot in contrast, many adults invoke spirits, moral crimes, and supernatural interventions. When we see young children's wonder as filled with supernatural agency, we impose the uncultured interpretations of adults. One couple created a very personal way to commemorate their participation in space missions. In the early 1960s, Tony Foster and her husband, Robert L. Bob Foster, an engineer who worked for McDonnell Aviation, the contractor that built NASA's Mercury and Gemini space capsules had a tradition. Whenever Bob completed a project, he gave Tony a new charm for her charm bracelet. These space-themed tokens celebrated the end of significant professional projects and offered a gift to make up for being away so much during intense periods of work. 
The Charms also recognized how she contributed to his career by taking care of their children and home, allowing him to spend time away as chief engineer on Project Mercury and operations manager on Project Gemini. Although the bracelet is now missing its clasp and is too short to be worn, the charms hanging from the delicate gold links tell an important story about the people who made human spaceflight happen. Your anxiety most likely has genetic roots. For example, many people that I treat at my center tend to have a family history of phobias, panic attack struggles, or obsessive compulsive disorder. The genetic connection can be close and obvious, like a parent, or less direct, like a second aunt or a great grandfather. To put it simply, this means that those with anxious wiring tend to be more likely to suffer from potential anxiety issues than those without. However, this inclination for developing an anxiety issue by no means suggests that it's a foregone conclusion. It just means the table has been set should you take certain actions to sit down and eat. This is similar in some way to someone with a genetic predisposition toward alcohol abuse. Even though the pull might be strong, you only become an alcoholic once you abuse alcohol. Although we think of speech as consisting of separate phonemes, it is easy to demonstrate that it doesn't. Think of the common activity in which a Muppet or person models sounding out a simple word. Letters appear on the screen and the Muppet says the sounds associated with them, one at a time, B, A, T, gradually decreasing the pauses between them. Sometimes the letters are displayed far apart on the screen and gradually brought closer together as a visual cue. The sounds do not fuse into bat no matter how rapidly in succession they are spoken, because it does not consist of three separate segments. A discontinuity always occurs at the very end, when the rapidly but separately pronounced phonemes are followed by the word pronounced as a whole. How to get from one to the other, the Muppet does not say. The activity is useful because the child learns about letters and their sounds. It encourages the fiction that words consist of separate segments, even as it demonstrates that they do not. Unsurprisingly, processed materials are more valuable than raw ones. Lumber is worth more than timber, and flour is worth more than wheat. The modern analogies are that gasoline is worth more than crude oil, and chemicals are worth more than natural gas. Industrious humans used energy to upgrade their natural resources into higher value commodities they could export elsewhere. And because of the higher value density of the finished products, it was smart to do so. Flour was more valuable per pound and easier to transport than wheat. The same could be said for the water that goes into it. It made more sense to transport a pound of flour than the 1,000 pounds of water required to grow it. Water and energy made it possible to process a wide range of goods, creating value along the way. Authenticity and objective success are independent of each other. The fact that a person is pursuing a career path that is an authentic expression of his or her most deeply held values and strongest interests says nothing about how successful the person will be in attaining career outcomes that others can observe. Subjective success, success as perceived by the individual, could potentially be high even with low authenticity. While this might seem counterintuitive, Consider a person who had created an organization that was very successful, creating a huge fortune for the person. The person might subjectively see herself as being highly successful in this venture. But what if that person's true passion was for art, and what if her original dream was to spend her career as a painter? Her authentic self would be a painter, but her actual self had become an executive whose life had little room for art. This situation would be an example of an inauthentic career characterized by high objective and subjective success. The philosopher Timothy Morton calls global warming a hyperobject, a thing that surrounds us, envelops and entangles us, but that is literally too big to see in its entirety. Mostly, we perceive hyperobjects through their influence on other things, a melting ice sheet, a dying sea, the buffeting of a transatlantic flight. Hyperobjects happen everywhere at once, but we can only experience them in the local environment. We may perceive hyperobjects as personal because they affect us directly, or imagine them as the products of scientific theory. In fact, they stand outside both our perception and our measurement. They exist without us. Because they are so close and yet so hard to see, they defy our ability to describe them rationally and to master or overcome them in any traditional sense. Climate change is a hyperobject, but so is nuclear radiation, evolution, and the internet. While media are a significant cause of change in the social order, rarely are they the only one or largest one. Thus, while the emergence of television likely contributed to changing notions of childhood, 
several other sociocultural factors may have strengthened this process. One particularly relevant factor has been a shifting balance of power in the family. Unlike the traditional top-down family communication style of the 1950s, today's parents negotiate with their children about what they may and must do, and both parties have a say in the outcome. Parents feel it is important to involve their children in family decisions so that they can learn to make choices and develop their identities. The parental motto has changed from behave yourself to be yourself. Parents are more indulgent, feel guilty more often, and want the best for their children. They want to be cool parents, more their children's friends than authority figures. As we live in a world made of software, programmers are the architects. The decisions they make guide our behavior. When they make something newly easy to do, we do a lot more of it. If they make it hard or impossible to do something, we do less of it. When coders made the first blogging tools in the late 90s and early 00s, it produced an explosion of self-expression. When it's suddenly easy to publish things, millions more people do it. And when programmers invented file-sharing tools around the same time, a shudder ran through the entertainment industries as they watched their lock hold on distribution suddenly evaporate. In fact, they fought back by hiring their own programmers to invent digital rights management software, putting it in music and film releases, making those wares trickier for everyday folks to copy and hand out to their friends. They tried to create artificial scarcity. If wealthy interests don't like what some code is doing, they'll pay to create software that fights in the opposite direction. Code giveth, and code taketh away.